All right, welcome to the new Everything EOS podcast, the flagship show here at Everything EOS. I'm your host, Zach Gall, and I'm being joined today by my co-host, the founder and CEO of block producer Cypherglass, Rob Finch. Thank you all so much for joining us for yet another episode of the longest running EOS podcast, Everything EOS. Ooh, yeah. Thank you all for joining us. Thank you for leaving all the positive comments, for hitting like, for hitting subscribe, for following along with us on this amazing Everything EOS journey. Um, some news to update you all with. We're super excited about this. Uh, it looks like after just two episodes, we're already up to 460 subscribers on the new YouTube Everything EOS that's channel. So huge. That's amazing to get that in just two episodes that quickly. But uh, if you know anybody out there, maybe they listen to the podcast somewhere else. If they haven't moved over to the new YouTube channel, please let them know about it and encourage them to subscribe. And also, Telegram, after about just a month, just crossed, or I guess we're almost about to cross, 600 members in the Telegram. So if you're not there already, head on over to t.me slash everything underscore EOS. Join the conversation. It's a pretty lively place, and uh, we'd love to see you there as well. Um, but once again, please let us know that you like the show by liking, subscribing, commenting. It really helps us you know, win over the algorithm now that we're on a new channel, so every little bit helps. Appreciate that, guys. Yeah, I just want to hit on that again. Join the Telegram channel. Some of the absolute best conversations I, I've seen in the EOS ecosystem. And I'm not just saying that because I get push notifications every time there's a new message. <laughs> uh, it, it's some really smart people uh, and really, really intelligent conversations going on. You don't have any of the kind of noise that you have in some of the bigger, uh, more established channels like the EOS or Price channel or the regular EOS channel. But uh, yeah, like Rob said, uh, engage the post, like, subscribe, comment. That'll help more people find the content. If you enjoy it, hopefully others will too. Before yeah. we get started, I do need to mention that both Zach Gall and myself do hold EOS tokens as a matter of disclosure, but please, as we're sharing our opinions about EOS and about all this different software, about all these different tokens, please don't take anything we're saying as legal, financial, tax, professional, investment, or any other kind of advice. Um, we're not here to give you advice. We're here to discuss mm -hmm. something that we're passionate about. So always do your own research before you make any kind of financial decisions. All right, let's go. You ready? Let's do it. Let's get to it. <laughs> All right, let's just jump right into it. A lot of controversy over New Year's Ooh. Eve this week. Oh, man. Brendan, oh, Brendan man. Bloomer. This so, has been interesting. I, so to start out, Block One made a tweet. Uh, the official account said, in 2019, a global community launched EOS blockchain and introduced one second block times, horizontal scalability, and free transactions while transferring control from mining pools to token holders. Happy New Year's EOS. You've made history. So then Brendan, he, he re replied to, to a, a guy's question about vote buying, and Brendan's response was, and it was very controversial, anything that is unable to be enforced should be embraced so that the playing field is level. Vote buying can benefit all token holders by effectively lowering the cost of network operation if it is a supported practice, but that's a community decision, not mine. Ooh. What would you think of that? We, we can, we can oh dive into God. more tweets in a bit, but let's just start right here. Like, What were your <laughs> thoughts whenever you read this? Did your jaw drop I, I as low as mine did? Yeah, I was definitely surprised to see him tweeting something like this, especially like this first sentence I think is pretty dangerous. Anything that is unable to be enforced should be embraced. Like, We can't really enforce people hacking into you know the dice contract. We can't enforce people exploiting system level node things. That doesn't mean that we should embrace those things, embrace theft, embrace hacking just because they can't be enforced, really. So I think that's a, a bit of a dangerous statement. Um, it, this, this whole thing has been interesting. You know, there was a big, big backlash, at least on Twitter and a lot of the Telegram channels, um, basically saying, like, what's going on? Why is Brendan in favor of vote buying? And then slowly, he's added, you know, many, many more tweets to this, what is now, you know, I'd like to call a tweet storm in a lot of ways. <laughs> um, but so th there are some other tweets. Uh, so he said, the EOS community should consider the introduction of voter rebates from BP candidates to introduce free market pricing to block production, drive more value back to the token holders, and increase voter turnout. Unenforceable rules only hurt the compliant. So this was from New Year's Day, and I, I think the tweet you're trying to bring up was the one he posted this morning that kind of cleared the air a little bit. Yeah, and this was interesting. So that came out, you know, he's talking about that, about voter rebates, about all these things, and people just are immediately, you know, going directly to, oh, he's talking about direct BP to voter pay. Like, hey, you vote for me, I'll pay you X percent of my block rewards, which right now, by the way, would be zero since most BPs are losing money. Um, but then he, he tweeted out again this 
morning, I think to kind of clarify everything, maybe this was his plan all along. Maybe he's covering up for that an original tweet and this is like his clarification post. But he said, if EOS voter rebates go to all voters equally, despite who they vote for, so a non-biased incentive, a voter can choose to elect a higher cost BP without inequitable individual sacrifice. This allows block producers to pitch any avenue of value cre- creation and still remain competitive. So I responded to this because yeah. this whole time I was talking with other people on Telegram saying, I don't like the fact that BPs would pay a voter directly, but non-biased voting incentives like Rex actually make a lot of sense where it's essentially the network, you know, some extra fees that are collected in the network plus CPU leasing charges that could be paid to you for voting, but not for voting for a specific block producer, just for voting for 25 plus in general, which should, you know, dramatically increase the voter turnout. So I tweeted him and said, aren't you basically describing Rex? Rex will distribute leasing fees, name bidding fees, and RAM trading fees to token holders that vote for 25 or more BPs. Makes a lot of sense to me. Uh, so it's it's kind of funny. We saw this whole journey from Brendan coming out and saying anything that you know we can't control, we just have to embrace, which doesn't make a lot of sense from like a you know generalized statement perspective. Then so he kind of goes I, I, to you know voter turnout, and then eventually basically describes Rex, which is coming anyway. So it's kind of interesting. I think there's more to it though. So even if he did kind of correct himself by making it sound like he was talking maybe about the Rex the entire time. What are your thoughts about if you can't, in, because this has been an issue with the, the current rules and constitution uh, on EOS is if you can't enforce a rule such as having more than one block producer, how, how, how do you enforce the rules? Like, how do you level the playing field so that the honest people aren't losing out here? Like, how do you? Yeah, how do you f- I think there are some. So, for, for example, owning more than one block producer, I think that's a rule we can actually enforce. I believe Telos kicked a couple people off their network with consent of the BPs. Um, so, it's something that c- could technically be enforced. But again, vote buying is something that's so hard to you know, prove, first of all, and then pinpoint and then eventually enforce. And how do you enforce it? Do you take money from them? Do you ban them from the network? All, the, all this kind of stuff comes up. So, I agree that once we actually have a constitution that's voted into referendum, that this should not be a clause. I don't think we should prohibit or, or allow explicitly vote buying in any way, just kind of leave it up to the community. So I agree, you know, don't put in rules that can't be unenforced because then that degrades the overall, you know, esteem of the constitution when people say, well, you're not enforcing that rule. How can you enforce this one? But I think there's a better way to go about it that doesn't just, you know, make us put our hands in the air and go, oh, screw it, you know, let's turn into Lisk and be corrupt like everyone else and just pay out everybody and race to the bottom. So I think there's a middle ground here. So I was talk- I, obviously we were all talking about this a lot over the last day, but um, a good analogy I came up with was, do you remember um, when PEDs were like the thing in baseball and sports in general, like PEDs. steroids? Oh, oh, oh. performance Performance enhancing drugs. drugs. (laughs) So obviously in the Olympics and professional sports, steroids, performance enhancing drugs are banned. Right. But science could usually advance faster than the tests can keep up. So the the players that aren't playing by all of the rules are at an unfair advantage constantly. And it's very hard to catch them because the tests can't keep up with the drugs that keep being created each year. So I've always been of the opinion to let athletes take whatever they want because that's the only way you could level a playing field is to just allow honest people to have the same advantages as the dishonest people. So that I, I see that very comparable in this situation because if you can't stop it, then the only people who are losing out in this deal are the honest people and the corrupt people who are dishonest or bending the rules are the ones who are always going to win. So how do you stick up for honest people if you can't... Uh, punish the dishonest people or you can't enforce the rules against dishonest people. Yeah, I think a lot of what this takes also is just more voter participation to then reward the honest people and, you know, punish in some way or just not reward the dishonest people. You know, if because what we don't want to have happen is is a BP comes out, they're being honest now about vote buying. They say, hey, we're de- redistributing 80% of our rewards back to the community. Then another BP comes out and says, hey, we'll give you 90% if you vote for us. And another one comes out, we'll give you 95% and you race to the bottom and then no, you know, nobody's reinvesting in infrastructure. None of this stuff is happening. Um, but in well, order the, the to- The race to the bottom thing has happened before. You oh, actually yeah. have experience in other DPoS systems, don't yeah. you? I, I remember when, before- uh, you were a block producer. Whenever we used to work together at ICO, or you were still running some nodes on Rise, and I, I don't know if you're still doing Lisk at that time. But you're you're telling me before we started recording that 
the same thing happened there, and it, it was literally a race to the bottom. You want to oh, kind of give some insight on, on what happened on both those systems? Yeah, so I'm making a, a more in-depth video series on Lisk in particular on how you know they had this promising DPoS system, much like EOS. They said, hey, we're going to do sidechains, we're going to do all this great stuff. And then over time, this cartel that is self, self-named self Lisk Elite, which is about 35 block producers, <laughs> effectively controlled the entire network and then raced to the bottom to the point where everybody else was paying out you know, all of their money, essentially. Um, so I never ran a BP on Lisk, but I was, you know, actively participating within that community, voting for BPs, um, doing all that good stuff. On Rise, I actually did run a BP, um, was part of that network for a while. But anyway, what happened on Lisk was essentially you had this group, Lisk Elite. It started out, I think, much, much smaller, much, you know, less nefarious, much like is what happening, much like what is happening now with Stardios and their games.eos um, second BP. It seems like, oh, you know, it's only one block producer, not really a big deal. Maybe we can let it slide. Maybe we can't. They kind of have this, you know, separation. It's they're kind of not the same entity. Same thing kind of happened on Lisk. A couple started doing it. Hey, we'll give you, you know, 50% of our block awards as a thank you for voting for us. But over time, what this turned into was if you were a block producer that wasn't paying out, suddenly you weren't getting any votes. It didn't matter that you were investing in infrastructure. It didn't matter that you were creating content. None of that mattered. All that mattered was, hey, I'm not going to vote for you unless you're you're paying me to vote. And slowly but surely, the entire network became this where literally every spot, one to 101, I believe it is on Lisk, 101 block producers, is taken by somebody that's paying out the super majority, like 80 plus percent of all of their rewards automatically to people who are voting for them. So when this happens, those block producers are making a little bit of money, they're making that 10 or 20% to cover their costs, but they're not reinvesting back into the network. Um, people aren't voting in quality BPs, and effectively now, that Lisk Elite cartel cannot be removed. Because in order to get the payouts from Lisk Elite, which are higher than everybody else, you have to vote for all 35 of 35 some oh odd God. Lisk Elite members. So these people are there, they are there to stay. You're not gonna be able to get enough people to unvote them because so many people are incentivized to continue to vote for them because they're making money from it, that the network is basically screwed. I mean, if you look at dApps on Lisk, they're basically zero. I think a lot of that has to do with this governance situation because the governance you know, impacted a lot of other parts of the ecosystem. And I don't want that same thing to happen to EOS, which is where you know, we, we say over and over, oh, this can't be prevented, this can't be prevented, but I think it can be prevented and it really comes down to the community. You know, I understand right now with only 25% of tokens being voted that it's hard to get the community together and vote enough tokens in to knock some of these BPs out. But I think in the long run, that will be possible. So I, I, I guess what I'm trying to say is, I don't want to be short-sighted and just say, oh, you know, we lost some other BPs out there. They own two BPs through this roundabout way. You know, we should just let it happen and, and let it all go to go to crap. And and then we will become Lisk. A year from now, suddenly every single block producer on the EOS network will then be paying out a percentage, not reinvesting in infrastructure. Nobody can vote them out. And the whole governance you know, model on EOS would effectively be dead. So that's what I don't want to have happen. And that's what I honestly think that we can avoid as a community by saying, hey, as a community, as the EOS mainnet, we do not want BPs who are vote buying. We do not want these direct incentive structures. Yes, we'll take a non-biased, indirect voting incentive like Rex, where I can still vote for whomever I want, but I also get paid and rewarded by the network from doing so rather than the individual BPs. That I think is okay, but I think it's up to us as the EOS community to, to put a line in the sand and say, hey, this is what we want. This is the way we want it to be because looking to many examples in the past, it clearly hasn't worked well for these other platforms. So why do we think that we're going to be any different if we follow down the same you know, slippery slope? So he did clarify. So it does, are you of the opinion that like he was backtracking when he tweeted today and made it sound more like Rex? Or do you think that was his intention the whole time? I think it's possible it was both. I think maybe, you know, it, it was New Year's Eve. I really don't think he was like drunk tweeting or anything. <laughs> you know, you can make a joke about that, but mm-hmm. I, don't, I don't think he was doing that. Um, I think maybe he he had this like, this concept in his head and he just tweeted it out. And I think a lot of times, Dan does this too, they sort of forget the influence that they have over the community. So maybe his initial thought wasn't fully formed or maybe people took it out of context. I think probably Rex and this whole non-biased voting incentive was what he was kind of thinking of from the beginning and now has clarified it to the community. So what what do you think about on, on his one tweet when he ended it with, but that's a community decision, not mine? Oh, I think um, that's because yeah. I know he, he's speaking about him personally, but you could also look at it as mine is in block one as a whole. He is the CEO after all. I mean, everyone has the thoughts and opinions are on my own in their, their Twitter bio, but you can only take that so far when you're the CEO of a $4 billion company and you're making comments like this. Um, 
that that part kind of stuck out to me because if you recall the the first time the controversy of the vote buying and profit sharing from Huobi uh, block one, they put out a blog saying that they were considering uh, using their ten percent of votes to uh, reward good behavior. Almost, yeah, I think much. really, I think all he's trying to do here, and I understand some people read that and they were like, "Oh, what do you mean it's not yours? Like you're going to drop these these tweet bombs on us, and then you're just going to leave mm -hmm. and say it's not your responsibility." And I understand that frustration. Mm -hmm. I think what he was trying to say, he was trying to avoid, uh, you know, a PR nightmare they got themselves into before, which was. Dan Larimer proposes new constitution, throws out old one. Like he's trying to, yeah. to to reiterate the truth, which is that Block One doesn't have any control over the EOS mainnet other than their 10% minority stake in you know the EOS tokens. But I think that was him just trying to say, look, if you disagree with me, that's okay because ultimately it is your decision as a community to make this. It's not mine. It's not Block One's. You know, and I think that was good of him to include just to kind of avoid mm -hmm. those fud pieces. Like Brendan Bloomer comes out, makes vote buying legal. Now anybody can do it. Like. <laughs> He's not this this you know authoritarian figure that controls the mainnet. So I think that was good that he included it, but I can see why some people got frustrated by that language as well. So with, with the Rex, how, in your opinion, how is the Rex going to work to to reward good behavior? Because I I have thought so. The Rex, the if you want to make the highest dividends possible in the Rex, you want there to be as many transactions as possible in the network. So you're incentivized to vote for the block producers who are facilitating either dApps or infrastructure that, that is going to enable millions of transactions per day on, on a daily basis so that people are using the RECs and having to purchase or rent uh, token CPU allocations to be able to continue using the network cheaply and fairly. Um, Whereas th that's completely different than if you're just voting for the block producer who was paying you the most dividend. Because right. I think that is what leads to the race to the bottom is right now, so many block producers are investing heavily into different software that might not benefit them with profits or revenue streams. Some of them are just for the benefit of the community. And those are the uh, honest BPs who would lose out the most if they're paying out dividends with, with their profits because that's what their profits are being spent on. It's being reinvested back into the community, which is what the original in intentions of block producers were at the start, I believe. Yeah. Yeah, I mean, that's been the whole concept here. And I think it's also I important to note uh, if you calculate how much money you would actually make, like let's just assume for a second that we became Lisk, we started, which Lisk, by the way, has a very high um, inflation rate. I'm not sure if it still is, but at the time was very high, uh, much, much higher than the 1% that EOS has. So people were making you know, substantially more money there than you could ever potentially make on EOS um, by selling your vote. But if you calculate what it would be, unless you're somebody that holds millions and millions of EOS, you're really not going to make any significant amount of money selling your vote to these BPs if it was a direct pay model. You know, if, if as Cypherglass right now, we're making about 300 EOS per day at, at $2, let's say that's about 800 and some dollars per day that we're making right now. We're really a little bit under break even with that when it comes to infrastructure costs and staff costs and a, a couple of these other costs that we have. Um, so right now you would be making no money from us and no money from basically all of these other BPs. Maybe some would be able to pay out some. But even if we go through the thought experiment of, okay, what if EOS was at $10? We're making 300 EOS a day, $3,000 you know, per day, every month, 90 grand. We'll call it 100 grand per month that Cypherglass is making. Half of that goes to expenses. Then we have $50,000 to pay out to thousands of people, maybe 10,000 people that are voting for us, they each get $5. It, like, is, is it worth the $5 a month to destroy the integrity of the network just to, just to get that extra money? Like, I, I just don't see, the reward is completely askew with what you would actually have to do. It's like, hey, do I wanna destroy this amazing governance proposition of this new DPoS network that is right now uncorrupted and right now has what I believe is a majority view of people in the community against vote buying, which is a pretty amazing thing that we should continue to move on and continue to you know, push that momentum forward, or do we wanna just throw all that in the trash for $5 a month or less? And it's just, it doesn't make sense to me why you would choose option B of destroying governance for this little bit of extra profit, when in reality, building a high quality governed network will, will likely make you more money through token appreciation in the long term anyway. So it just doesn't make sense to me why you would even want to engage in direct vote selling. I, I think the lesson learned from this is that, and, and I, I, you would think that they would have learned their lesson from the shower coin incident with Dan is, 
I think the executive team at Block One needs to understand the the power and influence of their own words and, yep. and how they're going to be interpreted by one, the general EOS community, but then also the broader blockchain cryptocurrency community who don't as fully understand the long-term vision of Block One as, as maybe we do. Interestingly enough, um, I was do, do, doing some digging for today's podcast because it, besides this tweet, it has been kind of a slow news week since we did our uh, New Year's recap episode last week. Yeah. And lo and behold, today, a new brand new job posted on Block One for a Hong Kong position, which, as if you don't know, that's where Brendan Bloomer is located. Right. And Dan Larimer, the CTO, is located in Blacksburg. A content raider position was posted today, and part of their job is supporting marketing and communications, including social media, <laughs> con- <laughs> blog rating, uh, community outreach, things like that. And it, it's, it's just funny and coincidental that this would come out two days after uh, Brendan made some questionable tweets that yeah. kind of got everyone stirred up. I don't think this and, is a coincidence at all. And while we're talking about jobs, because I, I think it's important. So there, there is a content writer position. So I don't know how many of our listeners are willing or able to move to Hong Kong to take this position because I'm of, of the impression that all of the block one positions, are, they don't want remote workers. You have to be in Blacksburg, in LA, in Hong Kong. And so if anyone's watching this, listening, if, if you're interested in content rating for Block One, go to block one, dot one front slash careers and check out what's available because this is, I think, what we need to bridge the gap of communication between the community and Block One themselves is uh, embed our, our, like, if you're able to embed yourself into Block One because then you are this like liaison, you, you are and were a community member and now you're, you're part of Block One. And I, I think that, is going to be very healthy long term. And while I'm on the topic of jobs, uh, Dan Larimer is in need of an executive assistant. <laughs> so if anyone's <laughs> willing or able to, and if, especially if you watch this show, because I would love to have a mole in Dan Larimer's ear, right. uh, if you have the skills and qualifications to be an executive assistant, check out the careers page on Block One because Dan Larimer, the CTO, is in need of an executive assistant. I also want to say, uh, before we jump you know, away and sort of wrap up that Brendan Bloomer segment, I think if we think about what's happening within Block One, this is a massive team now, I think 200 plus people, 100 plus of which are developers. They're throwing around all kinds of ideas, which is a very good thing. And I don't think that we should, you know, I, I just think that we should be cautious to only accept a very narrow range of ideas and then throw out everything else. So I think it's good that they're experimenting, they're talking, they're discussing, hey, how do we solve, you know, how do we get more people to vote? How do we increase incentives? All these different things. Um, I think it was pretty clear that the community disagreed with them on this point, but I think it's good that they're continuing to explore, you know, other potential options and aren't just set in stone on a bunch of things. So it'll be interesting to see how this all goes. And if they do get somebody to run around and follow Brendan and when they they see him open the Twitter app, they can smack the phone out of his hand. (laughs) So it'll be good when that position is filled. But uh, in all seriousness, though, we did put out a tweet also. Um, I tweeted Brendan. We got a ton of retweets and likes on it, basically saying Brendan Bloomer, or I think we should also extend this to anybody else at Block One. If you're out there, I think we have a pretty, you know, good direct reach to a core part of the EOS community here at Everything EOS. So if you, Brennan, if somebody else at Block One, whether it's Dan or, you know, somebody we haven't even heard of that works at Block One, if you want to come on the podcast, talk to us a little bit about this. Maybe we can ignore this completely and talk about other stuff you guys are working on. We'd love to have you. So that's an open invitation from us at Everything EOS to the people at Block One. You can come on anytime. Yeah, and if anyone from Block One is watching or listening, I'm just a short drive, uh, a couple hour drive from Blacksburg, and I think you're even closer than me now that you're back in Virginia, yeah. Rob. How, yeah, how far close. is Blacksburg I, from Norfolk? Or where, uh, I want to say it's you, actually... Is that where you live, Norfolk? Yeah, Norfolk, Virginia. You may okay. you may actually be closer than I am, ironically enough, even though I'm in the same state. I think it's still five hours away because I'm you know way on the coast, and I think they're in the mountains, so... I thought that was one of the coolest things. So pre-launch, uh, for anyone who wasn't around pre-launch, uh, EOS Go actually uh, did a, a video at Block One that I thought was pretty cool. Do you remember that one, Rob? Oh, yeah. They had that interview series a while ago, which I, I think would be cool to get a 2019 interview series. Hopefully, uh, we can work on something with Block One there. But I do remember Blue Jays and uh, Kevin Wilcox sat down with Dan himself, I think it was, at that table. Yeah, and he was like writing on a whiteboard about Byzantine fault yeah. tolerance and all kinds of like technical things. Yeah, that was pretty cool. It, it was like seeing into the mind of Dan in the early days. And a shout out to Blue Jays and Kevin for making all that happen. That was a cool series. 
So going back to Twitter, so Twitter Twitter's basically our news feed for this week because yeah. it, it's only been six days since we recorded last time and it was a holiday. So you made you made a video making some predictions also, uh, but you posted um, your your 2019 predictions on Twitter the other day. You want to kind of walk through them and I'll put them up on the screen for everyone to read along. Yeah, so I had my 2018 top three, which of course you know EOS mainnet launch number one, incredible experience, amazing that we were even able to launch that and only launch one chain instead of having a bunch of fragmented chains. Um, number two point of of 2018 was that the EOS mainnet is the most used blockchain on earth. That's you know in transaction volume, it's the most used. But then also, uh, top EOS dApps in 2018 set records for users in volume. We're now, there's more dApp users on EOS than any other blockchain, more dApp volume on EOS than any other blockchain. And the numbers that EOS is doing now, today, even on a slow day after the holidays, are more than any any of these other platforms have ever even done. So it's pretty amazing that we set all these records in 2018, but then of course went on to the 2019 top three. I think number one, what we're gonna see is some kind of a block one product launch, whether that's the hardware wallet, whether that's their own dap whether it's something else completely that that none of us are even expecting i think that's going to be pretty cool to see um Number two, of course, more ESVC funding announcements. Don't forget, there's almost a quarter billion dollars that still hasn't even been allocated to a VC out of you know the, the, the VC funds that have already existed yet, out of that billion dollar DAP fund. So we're gonna see more of that. And you can be sure that we're gonna see a ton of funding announcements for actual DAPs in 2019 as well. The chain is more established, projects have had time to work. Um, we know a lot of these funding deals are, are complete. SVK Crypto has funded somebody simply waiting to get all the, you know, the PR people in a, in a, in a line in a row so they can push out the press release, but there are going to be a lot of funding announcements coming soon. And then this was the, the big point um, that had some people excited, had some people skeptical, but I think in 2019, it is definitely possible that a single DAP will hit a million users. Now this could be daily active users, it could be monthly active users. Um, I think in some way we're going to hit that million users mark, and I think it's going to be an EOS DAP that actually does that. I think I, I could agree with everything. So, so your 2018 uh, top three, that's except i mean i don't think That's an there's any one, argument yeah. against any of that yeah but as far as your predictions product launch we, we've played the same bloomberg video clip of brendan <laughs> bloomer about a hundred times on here and he if we're going by his word he says well everything will start making sense when they start launching products in q1 2019 yeah so we're finally here in q1 so we we all have this expectation um do you do you think it'll be the wallet as the first pro well outside of the rex the rex is done we're just kind of waiting to implement it uh, do you think the wallet's going to be first? I think so. So based on the fact that Block One is now meeting with developers, I think they actually met with Said. I want to say um, from Block yeah, I saw that. Cafe, and he was tweeting. You know, it's not what you expect, but it is like the thousand chains model where you can access any any chain, any side chain based on EOSIO within this app. So I think it only makes sense if they're going to launch DApps, which may be on their own side chain, may partially be on the mainnet. Who knows? It makes sense that they would have a wallet first through which people can access their dApp. So I think maybe we'll see both in the same launch event because if they're going to, you know, Brendan had said in a previous tweet, whether they'll hold true to this or not, I'm not sure, but they had said that their first product would have its own unveiling event. Like it won't be at a hackathon, it will be its own standalone event. And I think it would be kind of lame in a lot of ways to have a standalone event and only release a wallet unless the wallet has some groundbreaking features in it that I'm, I'm you know, we haven't heard of yet that I'm not sure of, but I think it would make a lot more sense and justify its own event if they not only released the new wallet, but then also said, hey, by the way, the first dApp available in that wallet is ba ba ba, and it's Block One's new dApp that they've been working on for so long. So I'm excited about it regardless of, of whatever it is, whether it's the wallet or something else entirely. And just, just going back to a, a tweet Dan made not too long ago, we mentioned it on a previous episode. I think it says December 11th here on my screen. It says, we have people working on Rex, Dex, security, wallet, design, social, hard forks, faster database, all at the same time. Yeah. So uh, Dex is something we haven't seen yet. And mm. But Dex, is, a Dex isn't something that Block One will implement themselves. I think it'll be more similar to what the Rex is, where they released a smart contract code, and it's up to the community to not only implement it, but to build the front end for it also. So I, I think that Dex could possibly be released around the same time as the wallet, but I don't know how they would do their product launch because it would technically just be a code release and the product launch would be mm -hmm. done by the community. Yeah, why do you think that they would uh, not want to run their own decks? And because I, I feel like they could run it in a way where they still choose which tokens are listed, or at least have some tokens listed ahead of time and then let people list them after. But 
I I just feel like they're always looking for regulational and like legal clarity mm, and yeah. to be like uh, touching anything that could in any way possibly be a security, especially knowing some of the DAP tokens on ESIO with like the bet dice and the ES bet and things like that. These are dividend paying tokens. <laughs> yeah. um, I, 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 I think they're That's great and I think they're innovative and I'm looking forward to the checks token from Shintai because it'll be the first uh, dividend paying non gambling token, I believe, maybe, unless something comes out sooner. I think, I think the the Nudex token, NDX, full disclosure, I own some. I don't own a lot of it. I bought a little just to, to hedge it and have a little bit of all these different DEXs. I'll definitely be getting some checks and some uh, B1's DEX if they have a token too, but I, I'm pretty sure NDX um, will pay out a portion of their profits over time as well. It's not quite as sophisticated as you know the checks model, which I think is, is personally better, um, but again, just a, a small little hedge that I, I did. So I guess one more thing in his tweet. So there, there's also that hard fork stuff. Dan said that they have a, a lot of Im implementations that are going to really speed up the CPU on the chain. So we have that to look forward to. I don't know if that would be a big like publicity type release. It would be cool to us, but I don't know if that's something you would do a big product rollout for. Yeah, I don't think so. I don't because when I hear product rollout, I think like hackathon production level with a giant screen wrapping around like somebody comes on stage, are you ready? Are you ready for this? <laughs> and they unveil some insane promo video with their new product and how it's going to change the world. That's what I expect to see. There, I think the tech updates are just kind of come out in a tweet, you know? There's, there's one product that we know Block One's working on that's not going to be a security and it's going to be an actual product that they might actually be able to release and that's going to be Steam 2.0. I think that what else could Dan be talking about when he says social? Like if there's a team working yeah. on social, that to me says Steam 2.0. If they were going to do a big product rollout, I don't see any other project that we know for certain that they're working on that would make more sense than their social media platform that, that they've been talking about for almost a year now or more. Oh, 100%. And you can imagine if they coordinate the PR properly, which I'm sure they will with a release like that, if it's like, hey, download our wallet, now boom, you have access, to, you, you can get a free use account, you can try this new social media network that will pay you. That has the potential to go you know, viral in the mainstream very, very quickly, especially now that people are so, and we've talked about this so many times before, but now that people are so against Facebook and Twitter and these big data companies, which I think is great, because they have real privacy and real free speech um, implications right now, uh, I think it's the perfect time to say, hey, boom, we got the decentralized Facebook. It pays you when you post. You control your own data, all these good things that will get a ton of press uh, in the mainstream media. So it's only a matter of time. And it's just exciting to be in Q1 2019 because I remember yeah. at the beginning of all this in 2017 thinking like, can you imagine what it's going to be like in mm -hmm. 2019? And now we're here. And according to Brendan, if they stick true to that, sometime between right now, could be happening tomorrow, could be happening next week, next month, and the end of March, Q1, we should be getting that announcement. So I'm stoked. I hope I hope we see it. So pe people kind of rely on you to point to point them to the right direction of DApps. You're like the DAP king in the EOS ecosystem. You, you <laughs> do you that. do the short videos on the Cypherglass channel, which if you guys watch this show and you're not subscribed to Cypherglass, you, you need to do that. But I think it works the other way around. I think there's a lot of people that are subscribed to Cypherglass who are not yet subscribed to this new channel here. Mm. So oh, ma could maybe you could... A yeah, we can we can work on that. I'll I'll let the people know over there uh, to head this way as well. So what I was getting to is, and I know you already tweeted the answer to this, but the people listening might not have seen it. What are your top five DAPs for January 2019? Yeah, so I'm gonna start doing this monthly because I posted this once last year. I said, hey, here are my top five DAPs right now, and people loved it. You know, people in Telegram were asking, hey, has your top five changed? Like when the new month came. So this is just gonna be something I do monthly from now on, similar to how I do the this week in EOS recap on Twitter as well. So my top five dApps for January of this year are, of course, number one, Dice, formerly Bet Dice, um, and I do, of course, hold all of these tokens. Um, second coming up, which should be launching this month, I believe, uh, Pixios, that new sort of gamified art platform. I'm personally excited for what they're doing with NFTs, non-fungible tokens. So if I make digital artwork, I can say, hey, here's the NFT associated with that. So you know you're buying an original. Can also be applied to physical artwork as well. And they're working with some people on that, which is pretty exciting. Um, number three, Seed and the Parcel platform. We should be seeing a demo from them early this year as well. That sort of gives us more insight into their platform, into their smart card technology. They posted a little teaser on their YouTube video or on their YouTube channel uh, earlier this week, I believe. Maybe it was the end of last week, which is pretty cool. You should take a look at that. So seed, always a big one. The more seed you hold, the more seed you get in these future drops. I think there are eight more drops. Um, number four, of course, IQ. 
which as we know it today is the token for Everipedia, the decentralized Wikipedia. But as we also know now, they're building all kinds of other you know, Ooh. products, all kinds of other websites on the IQ token, which is why I'm so excited about it. They're building a decentralized Quora. They're building a uh, prediction market that uses the IQ token. They're building a an incentivized version of Genius. All of these different things where, you know, there are so many platforms that exist today, whether it's Quora or Rap Genius or Wikipedia or so many others that rely on users to create content. Even Facebook and Twitter rely on users to create content, but they don't incentivize their users in any way other than giving them little badges on the site, little, you know, you get a like, you get an upvote, you get some points. And what the IQ team is doing, which I think is pretty genius, is they're going after these proven models like Wikipedia, like Quora, like prediction markets, all these things. And they're saying, hey, we're going to add an incentive and make it make more sense for people to use our platform to answer questions here to you know cite their sources here than to do it on a centralized platform so what they're doing with iq is awesome we're going to see a lot more from the iq team uh in 2019 but the number we, five we just saw it rob i, I gotta yeah. cut you off man oh, I'm, sorry, I'm looking up every pd I'm, I'm looking up every pedia while you're talking here yeah. and january 2nd so that's that's today that we're recording this every partnership with hacker noon oh oh i saw this and they're gonna help them with to, uh with citing right yeah, to contribute, like Hacker yeah. Noon, I love Hacker Noon as like a, a news resource for anything technology related, blockchain or not. They're, they're just such a, a, a great trusted uh, content source. Yeah. And they're going to be contributing to Everipedia and the wiki pages now. And that that's awesome that they're going to kind of put some funding towards that and definitely put some sweat equity towards it. I'm, I'm excited for that. Um, yeah, I saw but continue that. on. You, you have no, one more okay. dap, then I'll, I'll get back into this. I saw that from Blockfolio Signal this morning. and was like, oh, cool, Hacker Noon, <laughs> and then just sort of disregarded it. We should have included that in here. Um, but the, the fifth dap, something we talked about already, um, this was a spot, it was a, a hold up between Higher Vibes, which I'm still a holder of, still love the platform, and Nudex, which is something I just recently acquired as you know a little hedge into uh, this exchange space, since I'm going to be buying some of these other exchange tokens as well. And I, I just want to have exposure to that side of the ecosystem. So NDX, the Nudex token, um, has some pretty interesting incentive models going on. Again, like I said earlier, not quite as complex or, or maybe uh, innovative as something like Chintai and the Chex token, but you know, there's some potential there as Nudex continues to grow in volume, as more EOS users get there. Seems to be the main EOS decks at the moment. So that's my top five for, for uh, January. Um, we'll see how it changes in February. I'm excited to see. I, I couldn't help but notice you left two of them off. And I, I think you've done videos on both of them. So since chat, yeah. I believe their beta their beta's out, so I'm excited to try that. Uh, their community manager Elias reached out to me the other day. Hi Elias, if you're watching, and I'm going to be able to test the beta out. How how was that for you? Because you actually got to test yeah. a call on it a couple weeks ago. It's pretty cool. With, so since it's it's truly peer to peer. So right now, you know, you and I were talking on Skype. Um, we're not going peer to peer. We're going. We're hitting Skype servers. There, they and the NSA and, and the CIA and all these other people are logging this conversation. Right? It's not private. It's not secure. We're we're on all these other servers. But with Sense, if I want to have a conversation with you, with you, Zach, I can call you basically through your EOS account, from my EOS account to yours, directly peer to peer, just me to you, no intermediary. We're not hitting servers. The NSA can't really intercept that. Well, they probably can in some way, but, <laughs> um, knowing them. But th there's no server that we're sitting on. We're going direct. And the same with, with text chatting as well. So I'm excited about it as a potential to replace Telegram. You know, we, we think about Telegram, and I had this, this sort of realization last night. I, I was in Telegram going, Oh, cool. You know, we have our Everything EOS channel. We have this. It feels like a decentralized protocol already, the way Telegram looks. Mm -hmm. Like, you never really see the Telegram logo. You're kind of in these other subgroups, but Telegram still has the power to ban you. Like, my brother Ben got, uh, you know, wrongfully banned recently and had to get that corrected because he was posting so much. Um, Telegram still has that centralized control. And I think Sense has the potential to disrupt that. Give us that true, you know, hey, this is just a protocol. Build whatever chat you want on top of it. Give us that. And, and also, of course, give us privacy back with all these conversations that we're having. And the, the other dap I wanted to mention that wasn't on your list is Karma. So Karma yeah. finally released uh, their, their application on both Apple and Android. Oh, nice. So I highly recommend everyone check that out because uh, Dallas Rushing and his team, they've been, they've been kind of hacking away at this for a long time now. And it's, it's, it's cool to finally see it in, fruit, in, like, in, in usable form. And the user interface is actually pretty slick, especially uh, when you think 
of all the other decentralized applications on other blockchains and what we're used to seeing. Uh, it's just really cool. I'm look. I'm big on the the social uh, media platforms. This one's not so much. Uh, what I'm interested in more posting content, like uh, blogging content and video content. So that's why I'm excited for Steam 2.0. Yeah. But as far as just connecting to individuals and staying in touch and things like that and trying to to do good for the environment, the community, and get reputation points for that. I highly recommend everyone check out Karma. It's a pretty cool dap uh, from the little bit of time I've played with it. I'll play with it a little bit more. Maybe I have more to say later, but um, have you had a chance to mess with it at all? Not yet, but I need to download it because I love the fact that now for the first time you can download a blockchain app just by going to the App Store or Google Play. Yeah. Like it, that's amazing. And one other that we should mention that you can also do that right now is Lumios as well, where I go on pretty much every day when they have questions available and answer questions and I earn Loom tokens just for answering questions and with, with the thought in mind that Everything I'm answering, I'm answering it anonymously. The data stays with me. Nobody knows that I answered a question a specific way. So I love these apps. I got my dad and his wife to, to download Lumios, and now they take the polls. So I'll have them download Karma as well and, and check that out once I uh, have a chance to play around with it. I, I guess while we're talking about dApps, it is a slow news week. What's what's the latest with Privios? Because I'm yeah. I, I, they put out their own video. So I saw your video on it, which is very um educational but they put out uh kyle from uh eos vibes put out a video today or yesterday that i watched that was pretty good that gave a pretty good explanation where is that on on its timeline and roadmap and when could we expect to actually see something implemented do you have any news in that regard yeah, so the Privios testnet should be stood up, should be live this month in January. So, so many things are happening in January. We have a, a stealth project we've been working on for a while that will be released in January as well in the next couple of weeks. So, so much is happening. The Privios testnet is coming. Once the testnet is up, developers will actually start to be able to, you know, use the SDK, use the APIs, hop in there, start building dApps that utilize the Privios data storage layer. If you haven't heard of it, heard of it before, just look up Privios, P-R-I-V, EOS on YouTube, but basically lets you store data securely on the EOS blockchain. So if you're running a healthcare app or you're, you have a, an app where you're storing user data and you want to comply with the GDPR laws, you're going to need something like Privios to do all that for you. So January this month, we're getting that <laughs> test net and uh, we'll have a lot more details to share then. I'm I'm excited for Privius because it just makes too much sense. Yeah. Like, all we've ever seen up until this point is public blockchains, and not a, you don't really want everything to be public. I mean, if I'm signing up for a service that Rob creates and I have to give him my phone number or my street address, do I really want that information on a public blockchain? No. no. <laughs> but but it, it's something very important to, to Rob's hypothetical company here that he might be able to use. And because it's on a blockchain and it's permissioned, if I ever want to erase my phone number and address from Rob's database, I, I should be able to do so by revoking that token or information of my phone number or address. So it, it's, it's just kind of implementing things that are like common sense that we're just used to on centralized systems today yeah. that it, it, it's innovative because it, it's decentralized. That, that's... I think we still have a long way to go, but I think we're we're inching our way closer. And I I, I I'm excited, man. Q1 2019, yeah. just January alone is oh exciting. Just it's, with the stuff we know about, it's usually the case. Like when the new year hits, this happened last year. Like, oh, there's all this stuff coming, but it was it seemed like it was so far away. So in 2019, it's it. I'm like, I'm sure you can probably tell if you're watching this on YouTube, mm -hmm. or maybe you can hear it in my voice. I'm just so hyped for everything that's happening for the projects we're releasing, the other projects we're a part of, like Privios, you know, uh, helping with with Pixios being their strategic partner. All of these things are happening like right here in January, first month of the year. We're kicking it off right. So if this is everything that's happening in January, I can't imagine, you know. Come the, the 2019 year in a review, all of the stuff that we'll be able to list off and say has happened this year. So I'm just, I'm hyped, man. I, I'm ready for this. Let's go. Ooh. Ooh, what you got there? Hold on, hold on. Got a little, uh, something in this box. Or a bag. <laughs> bag? <laughs> what, what is that? <laughs> It's from Prime now. They bring it in like within an hour or whatever. But something in here is going to help with building a new set. I know my, my set has changed uh, pretty frequently, but uh, we got another one coming as well. So something in that bag is going to help with that. Oh, man. You're not, you're not going to open it for us? No, it's not very... I don't know if you guys will be uh, disappointed when I open the bag. <laughs> All right, so I, I posted from the official Everything EOS Twitter. This is like a Twitter episode. All I'm doing is basically looking at tweets. So I, I asked the community what dApp they're most looking forward to using in 2019. So 
if, if you're not allowed, uh, you already named a lot of dApps, but uh, what outside of the five or six that we talked about already, is there anything else that you're looking forward to to using? And I, yeah, I'm excited. I'm excited to use a lot of these other games. I know ITAM Network, who's launching on EOS, they have a game coming out. I'm excited for that. I'm excited to use Blankos and play that. I uh, just I upgraded my Oculus Rift. I still have the portable one, the Oculus Go, but high fidelity doesn't support that. So instead of having to, to work with my HTC Vive, which really is, I think, broken, I think one of my sensors doesn't work, I just got the new Rift in today, um, the, the upgraded one, the what is it even called? Anyway, the, the most recent version of the Oculus Rift. So I'm going to be hopping in high fidelity more and really taking a look at that. I'm going to be recording some videos of myself in VR, which should be pretty cool. So I'm That's excited cool. to use that and, and all the other games that come out on EOS in 2019. What, what's your avatar going to look like, Rob? I don't know. I haven't decided yet. <laughs> is it going to be is it going to be human like animal like robot like? Ooh. That's a probably human to start. I think you start out as like a wooden character. So uh, I'll probably try to make one that looks like me and then we'll go from there and see what, what craziness I come up with. So uh, the reason I asked that, that question a, a minute ago was I, I knew you'd say Mythical Games because I'm excited for uh, Play Blancos also, yeah. Blancos. Um, but th whenever, so Mythical Games, we introduced them a few weeks ago and they're led by a crew of very talented and experienced individuals with experience working at uh, Activision Blizzard, uh, which is one of the top game studios in the world. And that kind of leads me into uh, my last topic I wanted to cover today was um, a, a, a project called Azeris, which uh, Block One just did a built on EOS IO uh, blog article on recently. And what stood out to me was the experience of, of the team there because they have uh, experience with EA Sports, EA Games, 2K Sports, uh, Ubisoft. Did I say that right? Ubisoft? Ubisoft, yeah. Either. Ubisoft. I think both are correct. And Facebook. So we have another, this isn't an EOS VC backed team as far as we know yet, but it is another group of super experienced people who see the value of building on EOS IO and are building on EOS IO. So do you want to introduce uh, uh, what we know about the project so far, Rob? Yeah, so they say it's a, a groundbreaking new game challenge network, a game challenge network. So basically the way it was described in this article to me that, that makes sense is that, you know, Ubisoft as an example can go out and they can make a challenge and they can say, hey, you know, we're going to put out a quiz, th this challenge quiz after you finish watching this Twitch stream. You're watching somebody play the new Ubisoft game. You know, you maybe want to win a prize as well and kind of play along. So they can initiate a challenge to all of the, the people watching, you know, this stream, which sometimes is hundreds of thousands of people watching a single stream on Twitch. They can go out and say, hey, you know, we got this poll. Were you really paying attention to the stream? Can you answer these top five questions about our new game? And if you do, you can actually earn tokens, which will then be used as an in-game currency in some of the other Ubisoft games and some of these other, you know, maybe EA Sports games and things like that. Um, but you can then use that currency to buy skins, to unlock new maps, new DLC, things like that. So it's kind of cool. And it, we saw something like this. I think it was at the, whatever happened after the London Hackathon, the World Blockchain Forum or whatever it was called. Mm -hmm. There was a uh, similar block, thing. Blockchain where, you know, Live. Blockchain Live. And they had a, you know, the built on EOSIO section and somebody was there doing something very similar. But instead of, you know, answering questions and answering quizzes and doing challenges as, as, as a viewer to earn rewards, you were instead helping the streamer by like, you know, throwing in a token to help power up their sword to help them kill the boss or, you know, voting on which move they were going to make next. So I think we're going to see more of this. There are a lot of people experimenting in this space of, you know, Twitch interaction and live stream interaction because it's a massive untapped market right now where there really isn't a lot other than that chat box and a bunch of emojis and donations. You really don't have a ton of streamer to, to person interaction. So what stood out to me in the EOS IO, in the built on ESIO blog article that Block One put out was they're asked the question, uh, what stage is the project at and what are your plans for scaling up? And uh, I believe he's the CEO, Alex Casasovici. Sorry if I messed your name Casasovici. up, Alex. Casasovici. <laughs> he said, we went live for a first alpha test in September in partnership with Ubisoft on their flagship title, Rainbow Six Siege. So just so you guys can grasp this, there's an EOS IO alpha being tested on Rainbow Six, which <laughs> I haven't played Rainbow Six since I was in like high school, but it is a huge, huge franchise. Oh, and yeah. Ubisoft is a huge, huge game studio. 
And in, a, in addition to that, I'm not even going to read the entire answer because I want you to go read the blog article yourself, link in the description, but they also currently have a beta test out that's uh, an extension built on Twitch. So they have something going on with Twitch that they're even able to build something to, to run their beta on. So that's cool. And speaking, I mean, it's if you had told me even a year ago, hey, you know, in early 2019, they're not only going to be the mythical games folks who are super legit building on EOS, but also Ubisoft is using them <laughs> in a trial in an alpha for Rainbow Six. I'd be like, no, that's not like that's not going to happen. That's crazy. But here we are. And all of these things are coming into place. But I was watching Twitch the other day and I found myself captivated by the stream at night for probably a couple hours. Um, and it was a streamer just, you know, knew he had he happened to get 20,000 viewers just because this game was so it, it's not like he got 20,000 thousand viewers all the time but the game he was playing was so interactive with the audience that he got to that level he was playing a game called marble stream i believe it was and basically everybody in the chat there were about 800 people out of the 20,000 that were playing the game that was capped out at 800 in, in this game you could be a marble and they put you in basically this giant like price is right plinko style board um, where everybody starts at the top and you can see whose marble is whose and they let them all go. The streamer says, all right, here we go. And he pushes a button and all the marbles drop and they fall through this physics thing of like the Plinko board and they're going down ramps and off, you know, jumps and some people are falling off the edge. And he's saying, you know, hey, whoever makes it into first place gets a free subscription to my channel or gets VIP for a day on my channel or whatever it is. And he had literally 20,000 people watching this thing the games were immediately filling up to 800 people because so many people wanted to play. Jeez. And my point with all this is I think, you know, whether it's somebody like this, the uh, Azeris, or whether it's somebody like Mythical Games, or whether it's somebody else, I think there's huge potential for not just, you know, one-way streamer to, to viewer and not just one-way viewer to streamer, but also people playing collaborative games together where maybe in the future, you know, this marble game is playing, but the Twitch streamer goes, hey, you know, first place, you're going to automatically get that 100 US prize. Who's it going to be on this new course? And we see a thousand marbles going through this mm -hmm. crazy maze and coming out the other end. So I think a lot of stuff is going to be happening in this space. Obviously, we've been talking about gaming forever, but I think we kind of left out the streaming side of that. And it's cool that, you know, that is still being built on EOS as well. So it's I'm such a huge, so I don't, understand watching twitch streams i'm sorry okay. i i just i'd rather play a video game <laughs> than, than yeah. watch someone i mean but but i know it's huge so I, I i read a lot of cnn i follow a lot of news and they did a article what is it i'm looking at my screen december 31st on this Fortnite streamer named ninja have you ever heard of this guy yeah yeah, the he, biggest streamer in the world, double what Riot Games did on their platform. He, he streamed almost a quarter billion hours. A quarter billion hours were viewed on his channel in 2018. Nuts. And he made a salary of close to $10 million. That's one person. So this is like a huge industry. And to give them additional ways to monetize these Twitch streams, it's just going to make it possible to make a living off of this for more people than the top tier is what I think. What's, what's if you're like the middle if... tier, you'll be able to make a full-time wage potentially through, oh, through not just this application, but more and more uh, opportunities. Yeah, it, right now, most of the people mind. at the top are... Yeah, most people at the top are making most of the money, but... Uh, looking at somebody like Ninja, what's so interesting about these viewership stats that came out where he has doubled than I think it was Riot Games. Riot Games signed a Twitch exclusive contract with Twitch for something like $90 million for one year. They wow. said, we'll give you 90 million if you stream all your games exclusively on Twitch for 2019. Meanwhile, Ninja is sitting there like, wait a minute, <laughs> I have more than double their viewership time. Is he going to get a $150 million contract? Is YouTube Gaming going to pay him a quarter billion dollars to move to YouTube Gaming instead of Twitch? I don't know. But the amount of money in that space is already insane. It's about to get even crazier with the amount of money that these people can command. Probably more than some of the, the top playing you know, professional athletes. Because these people are athletes in a lot of ways, but they're esports instead of sports. So it's just cool to see that all growing now. I think I don't know what platform it's going to be, but I, I think these these like celebrities, these gaming celebrities, they're going to be able to create their own digital brands. So in an economy like High Fidelity, Ninja could have his own clothing apparel line, for instance, and he yeah. could make a profit because it's all tokenized and, and tracked on a blockchain. He could make like a let, let's say he makes all of the profit on the first sale because it's coming from the store to, to a user. He'd split it with the marketplace. But then it would be possible for him to make a percentage of every additional sale every time that same item is sold to the next person and to the next person to the next person. Yeah. So because it's tokenized, he'd be able to continue to have that revenue stream. It'd be smaller each time. I don't know how it would work. But it's only a matter of time. I, I've seen enough projects that are doing something similar. I may have, may have done a horrible job of explaining it. 
But <laughs> there's so many opportunities out there for the gaming and virtual reality and just digital world. And it's just going to blow our minds. And uh, I, I've been enjoying follow, enjoying following these built on ESIO series. Uh, is there any that stand yeah. out for, for you that you've seen recently like in the past couple months? I don't think so. None that none that really stand out. Are there any others that that you were interested in as well? I can't. There have been so many things that have happened that I, I don't even know that I remember. Yeah, they were built on EOS. I know Karma was one of them. Um, yeah, and I I, uh, I was gonna look it up and just pause it and then stop recording and sound smart. Yeah. But I'm not even gonna try that because a, lo <laughs> a lot of the applications they've done that built on ESIO we've talked about anyway. I, I think they've done it on um, what was ID Pass, I believe. That was, yeah. that, I'm looking forward to that in 2019. So that wasn't listed on your dApps, but I'm really looking forward to what they have to say. And I think they were the winners of the first hackathon, right? Was that Hong Kong? I believe so, yeah. And they're doing they like a, prize, yeah. they're doing some sort of biometric decentralized identity. Uh, and we've been talking about that for months now also. Um, I guess before we wrap up, what do, what do you think of that? We, we haven't really touched on the unique biometric digital ID. We talked about the B1 wallet a bunch. Do you think it's going to have uh, features for the biometrics? Oh, yeah. I think, you know, to the, that conversation we had on a podcast many, 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 many weeks ago <laughs> in, in 2018 about, you know, the, if they're going to give out free accounts in the Block One wallet, the only way to prevent a Sybil attack, prevent somebody from pretending, you know, they're 10,000 people and draining all of Block One's money by making a bunch of free accounts is to do something with biometric ID. Because I don't think they want to do government ID and deal with all that traditional KYC. I think instead, you know, they use the, the fingerprint reader in your phone, they use the face ID that's already in your phone, and that becomes your biometric ID then linked to the chain. So I think that's got to be built in. And, you know, I don't know, maybe a wallet could be enough for one unveiling if it has biometric ID and a DEX and a DAP store and all these things. But but who knows? We'll see. Or what if, what if it's like a Venmo? Like, what if it's a wallet that acts as like a Venmo application or something really crazy? If I could, if in the Block One wallet, I can not only store my crypto, but also store USD and send USD to and from people and cash in and out of my bank, that would be huge. That would be like another next level. Because then when I say, hey, you know, hey, here's my friend. I want to give him 10 bucks and pay him for my half of the pizza or whatever. I can send him that on this block one app and that kind of gets him into crypto <laughs> without him actually having to accept the crypto from me. We'll see. I, I, I think we're, we're stretching here on what, what we're expecting, but yeah. I always have high expectations. So I think that's a good place to stop. We covered the, the crazy Twitter charade with Brendan Bloomer. We talked about some awesome uh, dApps that are coming out. We talked about this new built on EOSIO spotlight. So much is happening. Even on a slow news week like today, there's still so much to talk about. So much to talk about not only that happened in the past, but is also going to happen most likely in the future. So stick with us. If you've been here so far, if you enjoyed this episode, make sure you're subscribed. Hit that subscribe button. Smash that like button. Uh, oh, yeah. Help us win over that algorithm on this new channel. And join and us on so Telegram, ladies and gents. Uh, yeah. yeah t.me front slash everything underscore eos join us there until next time i'm zach go i'm rob finch and this is everything eos oh yeah yeah